Did you run? Is this thing actually on or am I just loud? Yes. Yes. A little bit of both. We have internet again? Or we're just we're just recording? Oh. We're filming. Oh, okay. So this is for posterity. I'm streaming like really hard. Take one. I'm streaming really hard. <laughs> Go internet. All right, you want to kick it off? I think you already did. I didn't do anything. I was just regaling people with rural New York stories. It says you've been talking for I don't know, six hours. Fifteen years. All right. I really, I seriously have no breath yet. All right, so I'll I'll go until you're ready. I ran. Okay. Uh, so this is on the con. Uh, we've been doing this literally for um, fourteen all, years. All but one, all but the first Spookon. I think the first Spookon, we we're just glad that we survived. Um, and then, what? Uh, what? The uplink just came back. We have the internet. Um, anyway, uh, the, pur the purpose of this whole thing is to provide some transparency about how we run the con for a variety of reasons. One, uh, as attendees, you uh, have the right to hold us accountable to put on a, a good and productive and useful event for you. Um, and we want to show you how we succeeded and failed at that. Uh, we certainly have had years, uh, namely like when we couldn't keep the ticketing system online, uh, that uh, it turns out transparency is really important because we would tell people day by day, here's what we're doing. Uh, and so we've learned from that. So we try to be as transparent as we can. Uh, and secondarily, there are people who either run events or are thinking of running events, either cybersecurity related or otherwise, and some of this information is actually very common and similar across multiple events, but it's not like there's good pu public repositories about how do you interact with the hotel and how much it costs and all that kind of stuff. So we um, uh, put this out here, out there, so if people want to do their own thing, they have a data point um, and they can learn from us instead of having to learn all on their lonesome. Are you ready now? Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> I'll talk on the next slide. Okay. Okay. Um, so, uh, Shmukon Logistics is an LLC incorporated in Maryland. We are not a nonprofit. Uh, that affords us um, some good and some bad. One, we still pay taxes, uh, but two, we don't actually have lots to deal with all the stuff associated around the nonprofit. Uh, we don't have to have a board. There doesn't have to be votes. There doesn't have to be a lot of overhead and structure. And we pretty much do whatever the hell we want. Um, and, and so you have to kind of trust us to be good stewards of the situation. Uh, so we think we, we are. Um, we have no interest in being a nonprofit. Uh, you know, there are certain organizations that do it, and God bless them, and there are reasons for it. But for us, we're a corporation, uh, dirty capitalist. Um, almost. <laughs> Almost everything is uh, email and phone calls. Um, uh, we do not have big planning meetings every month, week, quarter, whatever. Well, I, um, Bruce and I do. Yeah, yeah, like we sit around in the you know, living room and jam a lot. So if you want to count those as meetings, I'm going to start billing you. Um, oh, I think, yeah, no. No, OK. Your rates are too high. They're too high. Um, <laughs> I, we, I know what you make. There's, there's not a lot of pop and circumstance around it. Um, you know, we don't have IRC channels and Slack channels and, and whatever. And so that's, I mean, it's good and bad, right? Um, uh, Heidi spends a lot of her time getting feedback from uh, other people independently. Uh, and so she's very concerned about getting feedback from other, like the leads and various volunteers and sponsors and all that. Um, but I think we found that if we don't have these big powwows or boondoggles, um, we're actually more productive. Um, and since this is kind of a side thing, uh, we don't want to be spending time doing things that aren't useful. And meetings generally aren't actually all that useful. Um, uh, planning for next year already started. Contract signed. Um, More Heidi, on that later. Heidi's already on all that. All right, so staff, um, we kind of go over this at the opening slides every year, too. But we have about 90 volunteers. That's been about the same number now for Gosh, the last two or three years at least, we grew um, a couple years ago when we added taping and streaming teams and made them robust. Um, lots of different teams. You guys are aware of most of these already. They're all listed up there. We talk a lot about how we all wear the same color shirt to provide cohesiveness to the attendees and to make it so that you can ask anyone in a staff shirt any question. If they don't know the answer, they should be able to assist you in finding the person who does. Yeah. Um, and these are not, I mean, this, the list of teams has grown a little bit over time. You know, now we have streaming and, and that kind of thing. Um, but for the most part, it's been the same basic structure uh, internally for quite a while. And um, having everybody in the same color shirt, too, also makes it easier for the staff to identify staff. So one of the things we um, pay a lot of attention to is that there is very rarely ever 
a time when a single staff member is out of sight of another staff member, there's almost always line of sight between, I'll just say it again, our staff. 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 It's an infection that you can get drugs for. It's a cane. <laughs> okay. Staphylococcus, you familiar? Like it's, a friend of mine got one swimming in the pond in upstate New York near a lumber mill and his face swelled up like a baseball bat at him, so. Ooh, yeah. Mr. Pus Doctor. It was really disgusting. It was actually incredibly nasty. He had to show up to school. Do, do like you guys watch those? Because they are so gross. Thank you. Yes, who said yes? Matt's like I do. <laughs> Tamsin, Tamsin, you're a pus addict? Nice. Jesus. <laughs> I'm just here to keep it real. So speaking of real, um, one of the questions, so I floated this on Facebook a couple weeks ago and asked what people wanted to know, and what one of the answers I got was, how much time does it take to do this? So at one of our business meetings, Bruce and I sat down <laughs> and literally on the back of a napkin did some very rough estimates of what we thought the time involved was for making ShmooCon happen. So I'll let you, you can't see that. I, I can kind of okay. see it. Um, so Heidi actually I can asked barely me to, see it. It's this big and I'm old. Yeah. Heidi asked me to kind of, to kind of help her tally up because she's, I mean, it's hard when you're inside of it, like, you know, how much time do I really spend? Um, and, and it's really a curve that starts sometime, usually post DEF CON. Like, DEF CON's usually the marker, like, it's time to start caring about ShmooCon again. Um, and so Heidi, uh, in August and September, will, you know, get the CFP online and get the program committee together and do all the shenanigans there and, you know, start to, um, you know, get some of the stuff together for the vendors and whatnot. And then it ramps up, and October gets busier. And November is really busy, and by December it's um, you know really, really serious. And, and like you know, September to February we say it's a full-time job. Um, that's assuming like 40-hour work weeks. Um, I will say in December and January it's nonsensical to say like it's a normal work week. Like it's literally like she gets up, she works. She goes to bed at some point, right? And sometimes there's some things in between that happen. Uh, but there's a lot of lunch. I like lunch. Lunch, dinner, things like that. Uh, and we take breaks. It's not like it's you know just absolutely incessant. But for those of you that work at home, you know one of the challenges is like if you're home and you have things to do for the job, like it's really easy just to keep doing your job. Um, and so since her job is literally in our living room, uh, even when we're sitting around, sometimes she'll get up and sit down, and like next thing you know, she's doing lots of work. Um, so, you know, she ends up putting, my guess is probably over a thousand hours a year uh, into the event. Um, I am otherwise gainfully employed. I actually have a day job, but um, come December, you might not know it. Like, <laughs> I tend to put in a lot of hours uh, myself, so I'm kind of busy. I'm like, you know, a curve below Heidi. Like, I start ramping up a little bit later, and then by January, I'm usually full throttle and pretty useless at work for the last couple of weeks. So, um, I'm probably putting in 400 hours. And then there's a bunch of volunteers. Okay, I'm really old. Um, Is your security screen on upside down? Shut up. <laughs> Maybe the too small. May, well, no, but my computer's too small, which is part of the problem. Um, okay, I think it says. <laughs> Jesus. Josh is fired. Oh. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Half, half. We're going to dock it by half. So it's not too bad, right? Um, <laughs> So, well, back of the napkin again. I mean, we just is kind of just a best guess by what we know from talking to our volunteers. I mean, it's hours and hours. I mean, to, calculating the hours for actually during this event was pretty easy to do because we know roughly. I mean, our volunteers, not all of you, because I know a lot of you put in a lot more hours, but roughly it's a ten. The least amount of time any volunteer puts in here is ten hours. That's the least during these three days. Yeah. Yeah. Um, most of them put in much, much more than that. And then there's all the prep time from all our different teams, which I'll let Bruce read to you since I can't. <laughs> um, uh, well, I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, everything from uh, the people, the reviewers for the papers, the Hack Fortress prep. Hack Fortress prep takes a ton of time. They have to get all the puzzles ready. Um, you know, it's ticket sales. Uh, David, Hadi, and I freak the hell out three times a year because of ticket sales. It's gotten it's, better. It has gotten better, but it's still incredibly stressful to sell everyone tickets. Um, and so we spend a lot of time prepping and worrying and then decompressing. But I mean, even time, like, every, every time I look at my kids and say, okay, we need to move these boxes over here, like that's an hour, right? I mean, that's an hour of our lives Like my kids are moving boxes out of my driveway, out of my living room. Yeah, I mean, like, it's not like we have a warehouse um, that things show up in and they live. Like, they literally live, like, in rooms and garages and shit. Um, so it, it's, um, you know, and sometimes they're in the way. And you're like, oh, the we have to move all of these boxes to this other room. 
And like, we don't think anything of it. Like, it's just all of ShmooCon lives in the house. So you're like, oh, we have to move ShmooCon over here today. Do, 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 and all the kids will do that. Um, sometimes we have to move our old furniture. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, so this, this was actually, we knew it was a lot of time. But when we um, finally sat down and did this, it was, I, I, for me, like, it just I was, felt a big sense of gratitude towards our volunteers, because they obviously do this for big bucks and two t-shirts. We paid them twice this year what we paid them and last year. And nerds rope, man. That nerds rope was the bomb in your bags this year. Oh, well, yeah, and, and the chocolate. <laughs> the chocolate is worth it, yeah. Only the best chocolate in the world for my staff. Thank you, James and Paula Young. And you can only get it in London, so I have to have it flown over. She's not kidding. Like, I'm really, not kidding. It's actually really good chocolate. I love all other chocolates, too. Just <laughs> want to put that out there. Paul A. Young. Um, all right, so sneak peek for you guys. If you look carefully, you'll see the dates for next year. I am so excited. <laughs> I cannot tell you. I gave a talk last year during Groundhog's Day, and I came in as Bill Murray, and I had a groundhog. We overnighted um, a stuffed groundhog. And it was at a secure facility, so someone had to screen the groundhog to make sure it wasn't an implant. Like, I, that was glorious. So I am really excited that we're going to be during Groundhog's Day. I'm really year. excited because that actually means I get an extra week. What? Oh, we have a whole extra week. A whole yeah. extra week next year. That, that's exciting to me. Yeah, yeah, I got to take the groundhog out, my exfiltration groundhog. Uh, <laughs> um, we're going to be back at the Hilton. Yeah. Um, Hilton's been a good venue. I think um, uh, they treat us pretty well. They do. Um, the attendees seem to like it. I mean, the flow is actually reasonable. Like, it gets a little crowded, but not, like, club crowded. Um, and I think it, you, people get to have good interaction and that kind of thing, good flow. And one of the reasons we like this space is it keeps us all contained on one floor versus some other venues where, you know, you have to go to the third floor for this, second floor for that, down this hallway a million miles to get to that. And we like part of what keeps Shmukon feeling the way it is and the atmosphere that we have is that we're all together in one space. It also is a very nice delineation between what is the con and what is not the con, although I know you all think LobbyCon is Shmukon too, and it is in a, in a sense, but it's also not. It's just not. It's not. Um, so hotel logistics, um, someone asked me, um, what does it actually mean when you deal with the hotel? And this is just a very short list of things that I do. But obviously, there's a contract. Um, you have to deal with you know, the AV orders. You have to deal with the banquet event orders, which is like the food and how the chairs are set up and you know, when they're going to come clean the rooms and all that kind of stuff. Um, I don't really meet with them anymore. We've been coming here for so long that I'm like, yeah, we'll just show up. And they're like, okay, cool. Yeah, normally, normally for an event, they'll have a big kickoff meeting with the organizers ahead of time. And they'll like, and It's okay, like this big frou-frou thing. And, and I'm like, like, no. It's all set. It's got your name and everything. They, it's they all serve formal. like a banquet. And you're like. And I, like we roll up in t-shirts and shorts. Like, hey, what's up? Um, like, Can we take it with us? <laughs> <laughs> and it just ends up not being not being important after you've done it a while. I think if it's your first time or you're new to this, like it's actually useful. You can ask lots of questions of the hotel, but we've been here enough that we don't need to. Um, the only thing Bruce inter inter um, interacts with the hotel on ever is trash cans. He's very passionate about trash cans. I hate not having trash cans. It drives me insane. Um, yeah, right. So um, I will say um, from a hotel perspective, w when you negotiate a contract with a hotel, it's just a balancing act of like what they're going to give you, how much it's going to cost, what kind of breaks you can make, like the hotel. It's like buying a car. Uh, so we don't, pay like, for, we don't pay for this event space, but the way we pay for it is we have a room commitment that we have to meet. So we commit to, it's just over a thousand room nights over the three days. We usually meet it in spades. We only have to make 80% of that commitment to meet our contract. Yeah, so the um, way the contracts will work is that if you miss that 80% mark, you owe in cash the delta below 80%, right, at the room rate that your block was at. So whatever the room rate here was like 210 a night or something like that, if we were short, every room night we'd owe the hotel $210. Um, so we are lucky that we can hit our commitments pretty easily. Um, We've never missed. Never missed. And um, uh, you know, in general, we're kind of conservative, and we still get all the space, which is nice. Um, oh, sorry. I thought you were going to tell me to stop talking. Um, stop talking. So I mean, you know, there are other. If, if that's too much risk, 
Like, if you don't want to do that, that's cool. You don't have to get a room commitment. It means you pay for all the space, right? Um, and so there's there's trade-offs like that that will happen as you negotiate with the hotel. And it's a trust issue, too, or, like, just how new or how well-known you are. I know our first few years we paid for space because they were like, well, we just want our money up front. You know, we don't know if your attendees are going to bail or whatever. And yeah, because if you roll up and be like, we're a first-year con and we're going to sell you 5,000 room nights, they're going to be like, that's some good crack. Like, there's just no way <laughs> that you're going to do that, so uh, just give us some cash. How about we do it? that way um, but once you build some some uh, you know uh, you've been doing this a while then they're like oh yeah you can do that all right moving on we'll talk about the CFP for a little bit so this year we had a, uh, I think that says 168 literally the words on my screen are this big and I can't read them so 168 yeah. yes we'll take it off preview that was dumb of me you want me to go back yeah okay wow, look at the wiggle I'm old you're old <laughs> doctor Oh, well, you app. can sit closer. Like, you have built-in Zoom here. <laughs> this whole front row is available to you. It's your fault move. <laughs> it, it's like if you shoot with a prime lens, you zoom with your feet, man. You just, it, it, you're in the fucking back of the room. Like, just saying. There's options. The young kids are sitting up here. Because they don't, they don't want old eyes. They're smart, right? They're like, I'll sit up there and not strain my eyes. So 168 total submissions. This is down from last year. Um, and it's down, it was, oh gosh, it was down by maybe 30 submissions. I can't remember. Um, I think this is in part due to the fact that I did away with the early acceptance talks, which didn't really mean anything, but it always kind of introduced the sense of panic, like, you know, four weeks into the CFP, and everybody thought that was the real deadline, so they're like, oh, I have to get a talk in. So we'd get this big rush of submissions right before the, quote, early deadline, where we'd pick, like, two, and then be like, okay, well, it doesn't really end until, like, you know, two more months. So I think that that's sort of why we were down a little bit. Um, I could be wrong, but there you go. That's my theory. Um, so because of that, our acceptance rate was just under 25%. Um, all of this was in, our in line, online, um, in the CFP uh, statistics post I put up a couple weeks ago. Um, stuff we said at the opening, too. 45 speakers this year have never been on ShmooCon stages. 10 are first time on any stage, really. And, uh, well, one speaker is now. I think the most prolific person on our stages is David in the room. I think Matt Blaze is now our most prolific speaker by virtue of being on our stage twice this year. I think he finally passed Sergey. Oh, yeah, probably. All right. Any questions about these stats? We're going to continue to talk about the CFP in a minute, but any question about these stats? Okay. Okay. So um, review process, another question that came to me on the Book of Faces uh, was what do we, how do we handle it? So we use OpenConf. <laughs> Welcome, Bob. He's up front, everyone. Bob came up to read the slides. Thanks, Bob. Let's hear it for Bob. Yay. Do you like OpenConf? I was trying to be subtle. <laughs> I will not allow subtlety in this room. <laughs> Do I like OpenConf? Um, for our purposes, it's fine. Um, I don't use half of what it offers. So... Um, but I pay for it because I've been using it for free for so long that I finally just decided I should probably give them some money because I've been using it for free for like, you know, eight years. And then it was like, well. There are, there are ones out there, there are conference planning systems and paper systems that now also integrate with like the ticketing system and that kind of thing. Or like it's they like self-built the program and stuff. I don't use any of that. Yeah. I mean, honestly, in its bare, born, bare bones format, it was what we needed. Upgrading did allow a little more um, finesse on the back end. Um, I do like it better than other programs that I've played with and used. Um, there's probably something, I don't know, more robust out there, but I know how to use this. I know when it breaks, how it breaks. Like, I'm comfortable. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. Like, yeah, so the, I think that's the general it's, basis. It's the it's, evil that you know, right? The devil that you know. It's hard to find a program committee system or program review system that actually doesn't suck, and so you just have to find a way that sucks in a way that doesn't matter to you. So, um, just uh, we so also, you know, I gave DA permission to use Flash on us. Okay. okay. All right. Um, also, the, um, uh, we host it ourselves. For those that have looked at OpenConf, you can run it as a hosted thing where they host it. Um, it's still cheaper for us to have AWS instances and run it on our own. Um, I think they charge you by submission. In the they charge you by model. submission. Yeah. It ended up not making sense to have them host it, so we just have an instance in AWS right. we just spin up. 
So we generally have between 15 and 20 people on our review committee. Um, some of those are more, I, I hate to use the word committed, but more committed than others, just because some of those people also have other roles that they fulfill for the conference, so they don't review maybe as many talks as others. Um, our goal for each submission is that it, it gets at least four sets of eyes on it. Usually it's a little more, but if we're very strict about the four cutoff. Um, the talks are scored. There's a scoring algorithm in OpenConf, and I think it goes from one to six, where one is like, God, no, and six is like, if it's not on the stage, I'm going to cry. Um, so, and the reviewers are supposed to then score the talk, and then they leave comments um, for me, Bruce, John, and Ben, who review the talks later. So when, the, um, when all the reviewing is done, that, that's when the kind of the real fun begins, because I usually go in and I take the first cut at sort of starting to build a program. And score is important, but it's not the only thing we're looking at. It's a balance of the different topics, like you might get two talks that are kind of really identical and having to pick which one of those might be the better talk. It's balancing the tracks. Yeah. Um, I mean, at, at the end of the day, we're trying to build a program that we think is right for the attendees um, and having like if the topic du jour is like voting security, you don't need five voting security talks. You maybe need two. Uh, yeah, you maybe need Matt Blaze and another. Um, and so like, you know, when, you, when we think about it as a program for the attendees versus like something, you know, geared around the speakers, if you will, I think you'll, that's our optics, um, is trying to make sure that we're doing the right thing for, for you all. And, you know, I think you guys all know this, but we do tend to um, give more weight to first-time first time speakers. I mean, that's something we've always pushed um, for our stages. And, I mean, sometimes that's really great. And sometimes, you know, we might get bit by that a little. But I think in general it's really worked out for us. Um, any other information you guys want to know about the CFP process or the call for papers? The distribution of scores. So generally, if a talk gets like a one, it's because they didn't follow directions, right? I mean, that's like you open that, you open the the submission, and it's like instead of being all these A through whatever it was, whatever eighteen things we asked for, there's like a paragraph, and you should pick me. Well, that's a one, right? Um, most of the talks, if they are complete and with any sort of, I hate to say merit, but with merit, they're going to land. They land in that three to four zone. And then um, the really, really, the standouts are going to be in the five and six, and those are more rare. But I'd say the bulk of the talks probably are in the f Yeah, I mean, I fours. think um, five, above five is super rare to get that kind of agreement. Um, and in reality, like low fours is a real common point for most of the talks yeah. to come out of. So just so you know, like, where they land on the, on the scale. The question back there, and I'm sorry, the question, Todd's question was, what's the distribution of the scores? We do, and I haven't. We I have taken all the requests for feedback this year, but because we were a little delayed on um, when we opened the CFP and then closed it, we haven't started that um, that process. But we will absolutely once the con is over next week. We'll be sitting down, and I'm I'm really passionate about that feedback. Um, I know we haven't always been able to deliver on on it because of just uh, last year we had a kind of a life issue, a personal life issue that prevented us from getting a lot of that out. But in general. Um, I don't even let anybody else do it because I want to, there's a way I like to do it. So, yes? So it's funny, when, when there's a high scoring submission, like the review committee gets excited and like 15 people will review it because they all like it. They're like, oh, everybody else like this. Do I like it? I like it too. So they, they're just, I mean, yeah. They're trying, there's a trying. Well, the question was, I'm are sorry. they new people? Yeah. Oh, sometimes there are new people. Yeah, but I mean, so uh, I mean, to be to be blunt, like Matt's a pro, right? Like, and and I mean, this has been his life for a long time. So Matt can jam out a CFP response to a hacker con, like it's pretty easy. Um, but he's been on program committees, you know. He's it, it, what, that, that's he knows so, how to write. So a he's, CFP he's a little bit in rarefied space. I, I think in general, though, um, I don't recall seeing a lot of like rhyme or reason to like, you know people that we know being up top or newbies being on top. I mean, there are plenty of people that like are well known to us that like one year will rate really well and the next year you read it like way below the cut line. Just didn't right. and, for, and for I think, a variety um, of reasons, right? It may not be the, the quality of the content, but the targeting for like what we're trying to do, like people read this like this isn't really the right venue or whatever. Um, I think my, maybe my personal experience is that the more practice you get at writing CFP responses, 
pros or cons, like working or not working, you'll start to get a feel for like, what do I need to put in here and how does it work? And you'll see people who have more maturity around that, kind of bubbles were the top. But even then, like you get people who are just like, woo, and they like write a great response because it's complete whatever, they're full of energy, like this is my first time. Like, you should do everyone like this, like it's awesome. Yeah, I, I, we, there are certainly talks that are rated in the five and six range that are people we've never heard of. Yeah. Um, because they're passionate about it and they took the time to do what we asked of them in a very well done way. So um, John has a comment. Maybe not. Okay. Any other questions on DA? Oh, Sorry. Yeah. Uh, it looks like there How much back and forth do we have with the the um, the potential speakers or the submissions? Um, so, I mean, it just depends. Usually not very much. Um, I, I'm sort of of the opinion that if I have to walk you through your submission, then, which I feel really bad about saying that out loud. I'm sorry, everybody. But if you have questions about your submission, please contact me. Just don't submit your submission and then expect me to help you when I look at your submission. I will absolutely help you prior to submission. We are all there for you. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Bruce will say it better. Nope. That's exactly right. Oh, wait. Why don't we get to John's comment here? John's got a mic. Yeah, to, to offer a couple of comments <laughs> on that. Is this on? Just talk. I'll repeat right. you. No. So I'll just talk. Um, a bunch of us, including me, intentionally upgrade things like new speakers. If you are a new speaker and you have not, and you have not done anything before, you actually get in the review process bonus points and part of what Heidi is saying in terms of score does not ha happen overall, that if you look at things that we are looking for, which includes you're a new speaker, you're submitting a tool that other people can use, there are lots of things that we say we will give bonus points, that could get you in with a lower score than other people would. So it does mean that the people who are pros are thus operating at a small handicap with respect to other people because we expect them to do it correctly. And um, what was the, the next one that was there? I forgot that. Oh, just if um, if we if we reach out and you know talk yeah. to, I and I know that sometimes the reviewers will reach out if they have a specific question, but in general it's pretty limited. And, and I have reached out to people, and there are times similar to in more academic conferences where I have written, I will accept this talk if it has a shepherd, and I volunteer to be the shepherd because I think it's a good talk and there's good ideas in it, but it needs somebody to reach out and say, I want you to clean these three things up. But, but you know, go off. you, and particularly those combined, which is if you're a new person, you're more likely to get to get, this is a really good idea and I'd like to help you be successful to move on. So DA, the other thing I'm gonna tell you is that no matter what I've said up here, I, we break our rules all the time. Like it's kind, it's it's case by case. Like I mean, yeah. if, if there's a standout thing, like we're we're just, I mean, we do what feels right ultimately. Yep. So you know, grain of salt. Um, we're gonna move on. Is there any other information you want to see on this page? Okay. Next page is really important. How to hack selection. Number one. Number one thing. Always the number one thing for us. For anybody else out there, follow the directions. When we ask you to send us certain information in a certain order and you're like, yeah, I'm not doing that, here's a white paper, or, I'm not doing that, here's my slides, we're not even going to read it. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an automatic one and we don't read it because it wastes our time. If I have to dig through your slides to find your name, I, I'm not going to do it. And it's not that it's bad content, it's just you fundamentally didn't ask, do what we asked you to do. And I know we like to break rules as a community, but there's sometimes you've got to follow them too, just saying. You know, right? Yeah. Okay. No, absolutely. And Back me up. I'm just saying. Back no, me I, up. no, no, sorry. I, I was nodding in my head. He's like, I have to read the slides. They're so tiny. Yeah. Um, I, and it, it's really, um, uh, you know, putting some time into it. And if you have questions, like, there's all kinds of resources. Like, we can answer questions. Other people can answer questions. There's all kinds of people on Twitter will answer questions. Like, there's a lot of resources if you haven't done this before. Um, and if you have, I, I mean, I know I've gotten sloppy on some of these. Like, I've thrown a few in, and I was looking at it afterwards, I'm like, well, that was terrible, I wouldn't have accepted that either. Um, so even if you've done this a few times, like take a breather, don't submit it right away, have somebody review it, um, make sure you're following directions, um, and you have a pretty good chance of getting in. Right. Yeah, you spell check. Yeah, you spell check. So we joke about spelling ShmooCon correctly. I mean, it's kind of a joke, and really you should. It's like don't apply to a college if you can't spell the name of the college, right? I, 
little pet peeve. Yeah, yeah we'll get but to that so, in a second. Yeah, so my, my number, this was an honest submission, to be fair. It came to my house as a package. Um, but this is my <laughs> most favorite misspelling of ShmooCon ever. So next year, you will be welcome to ShmooCon. It's a moose, Shmoo God damn it! it's not a cow. Like, well, I don't know how female moose are called cows. Oh, maybe that's what they were doing. Yes. <laughs> What's really, really I funny... I the air at sea at all. <laughs> oh, don't go there. Um, last day on Earth. I'm so fired. Um, what's really funny is, like, we got this in the mail, and two days later, we got an anonymous gift of steaks. And I was like, hmm. We figured out it's unrelated, but it was totally really, unrelated. really funny. Yeah. Really nice steaks, too. Thanks, Turbo. Um, all right. Okay, I think I just do that, and I do that. <laughs> My favorite subject on the planet. Um, so ticket sales. We still run our own ticket uh, sale infrastructure. Uh, we've been doing that our whole existence. Uh, it's fun. I recommend it to everyone. <laughs> uh, if, if you're done with self-flagellation, run a ticket sale system. Um, the uh, person I come out of ticket sales each year, either a much stronger couple or not speaking for a day. Yeah, not speaking, yeah. <laughs> Um, so yeah, the, the way that it's structured is um, y'all get go to landing.shmukon.org, um, and that is literally just like an Nginx server that's designed to soak everything through HA proxy, um, and it just gets the shit kicked out of it, and it just sits there while everyone hits at five, and they got their little bots, and all that kind of stuff happens. Um, and then at some point, we do some things, and a new page is in place, and you get a link to go to the registration system. Um, the registration system is a C++ app uh, or a module that runs inside of the web server itself. Single core, single thread, FIFO. It is as Nobody fa believes that. fair as fair as gets, but it is. right? It is literally a single threaded application. Packets come in, get ripped apart, shoved into the web server process, get pulled apart. You either get a ticket because you were in front of somebody else or you don't. That's all there is to it. And nothing, nothing more complicated than that. Um, we manually go live. We've had problems in the past where things weren't <laughs> right, and the box, like if you type W, and it comes back like five minutes later with a load of like 22,000, you're like, well, that's bad. Like, I wish I could get into Cron and kill this, but Cron's just gonna be a while. <laughs> like, well, so and, and going live manually has caused its own problems, right? There was yeah. that one year where I logged into everything early. I wanted to be really ready, and my system like had just you know logged me out of everything while I was sitting there. I'm like, okay, go live. Wait, I have to check my password well, again? So yeah. for a while, we, we had actually written our own CMS for the ShmooCon website, which I also really recommend. <laughs> like, that's a... It's a fucking thank you for that. It was a brilliant, no offense, but he actually had developed a way that if you hit the wrong button when you were trying to post it, it would delete your entire website. So <laughs> that was a, a just the post, just the post. super post. cool way of having to go to archive.org to recover <laughs> your website Dude, every I used, once I used in a while. That for so long. <laughs> like, so we got rid of that, um, and then we broke a few but WordPress providers. But thank you. Providers. At the time, it was great. Yeah. Jeez. Then, they, th then somebody invented WordPress, and I got actually happy. So, and and, and so we want to make sure, like, we kind of do a systems check. We make sure everything's online and functional. Um, and then uh, I will actually manually run a command that lights it up. That's my favorite it. thing ever. It used to be me, and then we did move to AWS, and I was like, look, can you just do that? So the only thing I have to do now, besides all the other stuff, but the only typing I do on ticket sales day, like at ticket sales, is I pre-type the tweet that says we're sold out, and when they say we're live, I hit enter. <laughs> <laughs> That is exactly how I do it. It's yeah, pretty much the know. way it works. Uh, <laughs> you are done. Absolutely. Totally. Done. Meanwhile, David's going, wait, I'm not sure. I'm like, David, we're sold out. So, <laughs> Let me check. No, we're sold out. <laughs> so, so, so I like this to year, make fun of David, but David keeps us real because he's like, he's so good at numbers and data yeah. that I, without him, I would not, I, mean, I wouldn't even know my own data. He's just fabulous. It's been great. So this year in round one, um, people thought we had a really good bot countermeasure. Um, yeah. <laughs> because uh, funny. Um, we didn't go live right at noon. It was like 10 seconds after noon, and they thought that would really throw everybody off. Turns out I just mistyped the command, and I was like, <laughs> we're live. And David's like, I don't see any traffic. I'm like, shit, uh, up arrow, <laughs> fix it. We're live, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and people are like, that was great. Totally tricked me. I'm like, tricked me too. Like, 
That was totally on purpose, that thing. <laughs> um, and so then we've also separated the payment from the reservation process, and there's two reasons for that. One, um, in the past when we had a- When it would break. When it would like fly up and down and you're not really sure of the state of things, the last thing you wanna do is let people go to a payment processor and run it, and then we don't know the state of the payment, like we don't know if they actually got a ticket or not, because then you have to go back to your payment processor and like request a bunch of refunds. And we only process that. tickets like three days a year, so when you come back and then you're like, I know we don't do much business, and now we have to refund all this money, and people are complaining, and they're be like snap you don't we don't get to process payments through them anymore so we don't want to piss off the payments processor so the first thing is if there's a systemic problem we don't want it to go to payment the second thing that we'll touch on in a minute is we do check for shenanigans we actually manually verify each run to say like did this work the way we want were there too many people involved whatever and if there are problems we'll fix it and then we'll release things for payment um, so we continue to do this this way for a variety of reasons um, one of the primary ones is we value your privacy. Like, we don't sell your data to anyone. People ask us all the time, actually, can we have information about your attendees? And the answer is no. Lots of nope. people ask us. Like, we'll give broad brush strokes. There are students, there are other people. Like, I mean, it's. Um, Sometimes they wear black t shirts. Yeah. Sometimes they don't. So, um, you know, we, we don't care who you are when you show up. You just give us a barcode and you walk in the door. It's totally cool. Uh, we don't have the luxury of being in an all cash situation like you all. Uh, in, 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 there's a Vegas representative here, is why I'm pointing up to the front. Uh, Grifter, so, everybody. Um, so, uh, because we, la we do cap attendance, we can't just like have a big line at the door like a Southwest boarding party. Um, so instead. <laughs> Instead, we, we do it this way. Um, secondarily, Def Con line parties are cool, right? Those are cool. It's like a whole part. Yeah. yeah. Well, spirits. Like you bring donuts now. and stuff. It's out of vogue at Southwest. Um, so it gives us a little Cupcakes. more control or visibility. Like we know every step what's happening. Once you farm this out, like if we were to give this to some ticket provider, I'm like, because I can tell you right now, like that C plus plus single thread thing is a FIFO, and if you go to Ticket Wizard or whatever the hell people use, like. I don't know, but I have no idea like what happens. Like, well, there's some anti-bot thing and there's some other shit. This thing spins on the screen and I got a ticket. Like, why? I don't know. It was Tuesday. Like, I, I can't tell it's you the answer. It's also expensive. It's also, yeah, they charge you a lot of money for the spinny wheel of death. So, All right. Um, Moving on. Okay. More tickets. Well, it's still ticket sales. Who am I? I mean, we probably covered a lot of this already. Um, this is all some of the stats we posted earlier. Um, I won't go over too much of it, but we released, what is it, 1465 tickets over the total of three rounds. Um, obviously, we've sold more tickets than that. This is just the general, the GA tickets um, through the sales rounds. Um, so our total, what we like to call our sellout time, which is the time it takes for the tickets to get reserved and then for we have a wait list um, to fill up after that. If you add those two times together, we call that our sellout time. So this year it was 19.66 seconds. For those of you who have been with us a long time, you're going to tell me, well, Heidi, that's like really long. Yeah, right? <laughs> um, and it is. It's because we, did, we made some changes this year. I'm not going to tell you what they are. Um, but we did. We made a few changes. Um, and so it, it added a whopping, you know, like six seconds, sorry. It turns out when you're actually defending against bots and things like that, there have to be parts of this we can't tell you that we do for countermeasure purposes. So there are things that some people see when they scrape the website and there are things that they don't see because it's all behind the scenes. So we have reasonable countermeasures in place, um, but that does cost us milliseconds here and there. And so we ended up with a slightly longer, uh, longer time this year. All right, so the only thing um, really new on this slide is um, people ask me all the time, well, does anybody ever on the waiting list get tickets? And they do. They get, they get, wait list gets, um, sees a few ticket purchases uh, every round. Um, I think it was a total, what does that say, 45 people this year um, who got tickets yeah. across all three rounds, so 45 total um, on the wait list. Now, we did make a change to the wait list um, this year, and now if you're on the wait list, you can only buy one ticket versus two. Um, that just, we spread some wait list love, I guess. And also makes it a shorter time period for all of that to happen. We, um, we also shorten the wait list. We had, a, I think, kind of an excessively long wait list for a while for, I have no idea. Um, and then we long. realized nobody was ever going to walk away from their Yeah, like when you're 100 heart, some you know? odd people deep, like you're never going to see a ticket, so we don't want to waste your time. So, so and here's the thing, the tickets that generally go to the wait list anyway are, um, I don't like people who only buy one ticket. So there are people who only buy one ticket, but each like transaction kind of holds two, so that it just kind of bounces till someone buys it through the wait list. Um, anyway, right. you guys know that um, somebody this year got tickets while on an airplane? Yeah, we're gonna talk slow, we got four hours. <laughs> yeah, I never go. 
Um, so shenanigans, there, yes, there's shenanigans. It's not to the extent that everybody thinks there are. I mean, we know, we, we know, we know. We see it. I mean, we do log the shit out of it, to be frank. I mean, we log every, we know what steps, how long. I mean, we look at deviations between the steps. Like, okay, if we saw this IP, multiple things, where the user agent strings, how long did each person take to go from point A to point B? Is that possible? Blah, blah, blah. Um, and, and then if we do find things where people were successful at getting you know, a ticket or two in a way that we're not 100% happy with, um, we usually put in countermeasures for the next round to make sure that that's not possible anymore. Um, and it becomes kind of a cat and mouse game, but we found recently the cats are getting a little tired of it, um, and, uh, which is good. So we'll see what happens next year. But uh, We will not say too much more about that. I will not try to encourage anyone to write better bots next year. Okay. Much like I didn't encourage people to break into our yeah, house, house once. Yes. Um, um, she yeah. was really grumpy about that, by the way. Like, it wasn't even encouragement. It was an invitation. <laughs> There's a difference. Hey, I mean, someone did pick our lock with a pine needle. Yeah. So, in fairness, it was... <laughs> it, it was... We don't live in that house we don't live anymore. In that house anymore, first of all. But <laughs> you were like out of there. It was really a bad lock. It was pretty beaten up, and it was David, a really good pine needle. So, like in fairness, it was a good white pine, a good strong, and then it just. All right, boom. we have we have ten minutes and like oh, forty sorry, more minutes I'm of content. So real quick, secondhand stories. sales. Um, you know, whatever. Sell it to friends. Sell it at cost. We don't care. It's when you start making a profit off of our tickets that we get kind of grumpy. Um, we can't. We won't do much to police that. That's on you guys to police that. Don't buy those tickets if they're selling them for four hundred dollars. Just don't. Um, I know you all want to be here. We're not that good. Um, the, uh, but honestly, a lot of the because of you guys, the, um, a lot of that activity has. I think it's it's not as prevalent as it used to be at all. No. Um, you know, we still, like that I, heard, I heard about something on the DC Craigslist where tickets are being posted for like 250 or something. And that's really the only thing that got reported to me. I didn't check eBay too much this year. Which? <laughs> that wasn't real. Yeah, it was. Oh, that one was real. It was real. I have no idea. I'll find out later. Okay. okay. <laughs> there will be some funny story at closing. <laughs> well, may, or not, to be honest, or not. I, it's hilarious either way. Okay, um. we'll tell it at closing. Um, so, we do... <laughs> <laughs> what was that? I think he had a stroke. <laughs> so, um, just to get it out there, uh, we do run sort of an unofficial wait list where if you have, if you want tickets after the third round, you can email into infoschmucon.org. I will not answer you, but I will put a fancy little flag on your email and I'll know that you're in line. And as people who have extra tickets, because you all buy too many, um, email me, I will do the courtesy of matching you up one ticket at a time. And because you went through the official wait list where you guarantee to sell your ticket at cost and blah, 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 we call it lending a friend, um, I will then invalidate the original ticket and issue a new ticket. What I will not do is give the new person a receipt because I didn't get any money from them. So confusing thing that, you get a receipt when you pay for something and that person accepts it and gives you something in response. And so when people buy tickets even off their friends and then they ask us for a receipt, we're like, we didn't actually take the money. So it's impossible for us to give you a receipt. And that's confusing. I mean, we could, but it's just uh, weird. Yeah. All right. It's funny. Size, why do we stay the same size? If you don't know the answer to this, how many people is the first time at Own the Con? Okay, wow. I'll tell you the answer to this. That's impressive. <laughs> Um, we, well, first of all, we like the size because we think, we, all, we used to call it the, um, Shmukon was a small con, or a big con with a small con atmosphere. Um, and, you know, there's many things that lead to that being, a, I hope, a true statement, and part of it's the venue, and part of it's the size. Um, but the other reason why we do this is logistics. It's pure logistics. I can only pull a 26-foot truck into my driveway because I have these two stone wall surrounds at the end of my driveway, and anything bigger than that will not make the turn. So a 26-foot truck it is, and I will not outgrow that truck. So the funny thing is I'll drive that truck in blind on my own, and then I'll get professional CDLs who will pull up like in a 16-foot truck. I'm like, I'm not coming in there. I'm like, dude, like, seriously, we can do this together. Like, I'll walk you through it. Like, we can, we can do it. And we've had people just be like, nope, I'm going to drop all these boxes in the road, bye, and then they just drive off. We're like, oh, great. And if anyone's, it, our, our driveway's not short. It's a kind of long driveway, and so it's a pain in the ass to drag many boxes up our driveway. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Says my son. 
Okay, so who who's at Shmukon? Um, we have again 90 staff members. We have uh, oh that number's wrong. It's 60 speakers. We have 15 registered members of the press. Um, and there may be an off by one. Please don't check me on these numbers. I do know the total number is correct. 2179. Um, at, total attendees at ShmooCon. We are going to take longer than five minutes, but thank you. We're going to take like seven minutes. Just back up one slide. One, back up. There you go. Good job. Thank you. Um, I'm going to talk really fast. Um, so, so total registered attendees at ShmooCon 2019 is 2179 and like an idiot. David, can you go, or can somebody, somebody with a radio ask Reg what we're checked in at because I need to do this. We were just, like, we had like 107 left. Oh, somebody math. 107. That would be oh 2,000. Oh, my gosh. I can't edit while it's in playing. Okay, I'll do it. <laughs> I'm so tired. Um, I don't even know why I put it, this in here, because if you can see the bottom line, this is just as of whenever we give this talk, so it doesn't really, I mean, mean anything, except for maybe the snow year where we had slightly less attendance. I was a little worried about um, this year because, you know, we're kind of in a thing here in D.C., but... It might have impacted us Didn't a little bit. It did make a difference. I mean, we really, I mean, we still had huge, we used to give this talk um, on Sunday right before closing, so we had kind of really tight numbers of the well, we only, here. We did that for two years. It's mostly been, it's yeah. bounced back and forth. Yeah. The higher numbers are probably when we gave it on Sunday versus a Saturday, so. All right, vendors, sponsors, uh, 46 sponsors, including our lab sponsors. Um, I guess we're done. Um, <laughs> Six levels of sponsorship. Uh, we reserve the bronze level for companies that are under three years old. Um, they love it when I graduate them. They get really sad because they have to pay more money. Um, and again, we push our sponsors to be different. I actually think that we have a different vibe with sponsors here than I, I go to a lot of other cons. And I, I, think, I do think we're different when it comes to sponsorship. I think our sponsor tables are pretty interactive and we get a lot of fun things here. So. Um, and sponsorships sold out this year in? Well, it's funny. Um, platinum sponsorships, the, the big one, sold out in, what did I say, three minutes? Something like that. It's three minutes. That I, when, Once I posted that sponsorship was open, I think I sold out platinum. They were like the first four messages in. Um, and then the rest of sponsorship, I would say 95% of sponsorship was sold out within 24 hours, and then the rest of it was like three days. So that was fun. Zach's, Zach's getting ready for the party it's next door. Almost party time. We're, we're getting close to being done. So, um, in money in. I know it's, I'm going as Thank fast you. as I can. And just just keep going back to that 10 minute slide. Four hours. Okay. So in money in. I don't. This has been a joke between me and Bruce for how long? And I and in money in. Well, it's because I put this on the slide once, and Beetle thought it was hilarious and didn't correct it. Oh, um, okay. That's why it says. Uh, says that is actually from a talk that he and I gave forever ago where I said something in something and, and he thought it was hilarious and so this slide well, we say this says, all the time now yeah. like this is, anyway so um, we took in sponsorship funds just under two hundred thousand dollars ticket sales generate another two hundred fifty thousand those are the only two ways we make money that's it makes accounting nice um, so math this read that Bob <laughs> <laughs> I've been waiting for that the whole time <laughs> yeah the only reason I'm on stage anymore was for that slide. So. <laughs> That's good. It also says things I don't remember. So, um, this is even more comprehensive than the list last year. Last year I forgot to put the T-shirt costs on here. So, um, these numbers these numbers do change from year to year. Some of them are kind of static. But you might remember last year when I spent uh, $48,000 on badges. I just want to draw attention to the badge cost this year. It's like five grand, right? Yeah, it was $6,000. So, you know, this year, we, this year, we, last year, we, I don't know that we really made money at all. This year, we're going to have, we made a little money. But that's good because it balances those years when we don't. Um, this year, we bought a new toy. We bought a, a Roland printer cutter. We printed our own banners this year. That was fun. Yeah. <laughs> it's cool. <laughs> the laser sits sadly next to it, weeping. Like, oh, he's playing with something you else You don't now. love me anymore. Yeah, yeah, we'll 3D print the badges. I'm going to start tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. So anyway, I'm happy to talk about these numbers with anybody who's got questions. I know they're stupid tiny. They'll be online. Um, money, there's money left over. There's money left over this year, but it does vary from year to year. Um, it, I mean, it's just a soft roll. Like some years we spend more, some some years we don't. 
All right, I'm almost done. Is there anything else you guys want to see in Own the Con? I mean, we've been doing this talk for years. We weren't even that funny this year. I'm sorry. Oh, thanks. thanks. She's like funny looking. Yes, yes sir. Yes, Josh. What do you want to see happen in the next few years? You really want to ask me that? Josh wants to know what I want to see happen in the next two years. There we are. Well, yeah. Bruce, do you want to? I ain't answering that. <laughs> How long do that's the real question? Space Rogue's asking, or he is asking the real question that's hidden behind Josh's question, which is how long do you think we're going to do this? So I kind of have this, um, I have this thing, and I don't know that I'm sticking to it, but I'm 45, right? And I have long, long since said that I don't want to do this when I'm 50, or maybe 50 will, when I'm 50 will be the last year. I don't know. I'm not saying that's a hard stop. But ShmooCon's not going to be here forever, guys. I will give you warning. It will be a glorious last year if and when it happens, and it'll be fun. But I don't think, I want, I want to leave when it's still fun. I want to leave on a, a good note, a high note. I want ShmooCon to, you know, just be this positive thing in my life, too. So you would rather end it than pass it to somebody else. Absolutely. We were never going to pass this on to someone else. Um, it, I mean, it wouldn't be the same thing, and, and you might as well just start your own thing. I'll help. I mean, I give away all the, all the info I have. Very difficult, very rare, very hard to do. I mean, in general, for people that have been involved in volunteer-run organizations, um, uh, so I was, I was uh, in a um, fraternity in Fairbanks, and uh, we were the only fraternity in the state of Alaska. Um, like literally, like, and there was one sorority. The parties were really fun. Yeah, was, <laughs> oh, oh. So, and <laughs> can and I interrupt for one? No, no. So I was not in the sorority because I think that's so not who I am. But it meant I couldn't go to the Greek parties. And you know, here's my my fiance, and I'm like, You're, no, this this is no, this isn't a thing. Well, and sometimes they were nice, like the official Greek party lasted ten minutes and then it was open to the public. But they actually couldn't do that all the time because of some weird bylaw or yeah, something. I don't know. So in order to bypass that, I got myself elected as the non-Greek representative on the Greek council, and then I got to go to the parties. The Greek council that consisted of the one fraternity. The one, the one sorority. sorority. Uh, and me. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> what I was really trying to drive at. Uh, I like that story. It was a good story. Um, this guy that I met there had a saying that said, like, any volunteer run, run, volunteer run organization really needs a maniac at the helm who's going to do all the work when nobody else is going to do the work. So <laughs> I just got called a maniac. And now, and now we will all have that song in our head for the rest of the day. Yeah, I'm going to start. Yeah, we're going full 80s now. But, um, but it's true. I think to Josh's point, when you try to hand over these organizations, it's rare that you're able to find someone that's got not only is kind of philosophically aligned with what you know she's trying to do, but also uh, has the drive and motivation. They might survive a year or two, and then they're like, "Well, shit, this is hard." You're like, "Yeah, I really would." Wow, you're surprised, like. That um, uh, I, it's it's really hard to hand over. It's not handing over a company to somebody else. It's handing over a labor of love, a, you know, relationships and all that kind of thing, a vision. It doesn't. It just doesn't work out. So uh, I think yeah, when it's done, it's going to be done. Yeah. yeah, and you know, it'll be bittersweet. And then come next December, I'm just going to be doing a happy dance. We won't do what to do with ourselves. We like it's January. Like we have spare time. That's never happened before. So <laughs> right. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna save my laundry for months. I was gonna say, come 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 do our laundry. All right. So um feedback at shmoo.com or shmoocon.org, wrong address. Um we do read it, we like it. Um oh questions? Yes. Okay. Well, okay, so certainly, I mean, he's talking, he runs a conference, yeah, he runs a conference where they, they purposefully turn over the leadership every, like, two years or something, right? And, and there certainly have been a number of conferences that have run that way. Um, the one that's immediately coming to mind is Freaknik. Anybody ever been to Freaknik? Yeah. Um, Do I have any advice on how to not make your culture disappear? Well, it's so... 
so I think, so here's, here's something that I think is different between us and like DEF CON and some other conferences that are out there. There are some places that have um, really built up a strong Matt, community. 615 at least. Okay. A strong community outside of the event itself. You know, like with DEF CON, there's DC groups and there's all this kind of stuff that happens. And so people associate partially with a, with a culture of DEF CON as much as they do with the event. Um, and that's not something we ever sought to have, to, to have is to have the, the community around the conference. Like, we, we do this and there's, there's a community of people that show up, but there's not like a ShmooCon culture that really transcends this event. Um, and that's a conscious thing that we've done. And so I think if, it, and then so there's a huge distinction, right? Like, I mean, the feel, I mean, besides He's the fact looking that for like, you know, I'm looking agreement. at Grifter. Grifter's just deadpanning me. He's like, I don't know who the hell this guy's talking to. Like, he's like, I don't speak for them. So, but I think, <laughs> I don't, are you finished with that thought? Well, no, what I was gonna say is if you want things to continue on, you have to, I think, build that culture that transcends the event itself. Well, and that I, will help build you know, uh, um, you know, kind of an ongoing thing that, that outlives whoever is organizing it. For so us, gonna, we didn't I, ever want that. I want to add to that because I think, I think what Bruce says is absolutely true, but for me it's also important, regardless of me, I want to build that culture within my core volunteers. And when you have a volunteer, my, my staff, I have so, everybody's like, how do I volunteer? I'm like, well, you can't because my volunteers come back every year. I mean, I have such little turnover in my core. And I know part of it is because that's how you get a ticket. I get that. Right, I like dangle it over their head now. Josh is shaking his head. Thank you, Josh. Um, but if you if you build that community within your core volunteers, that's also going to that's going to radiate forth into the conference. And it's not really going to matter who's at the head as long as they continue with that kind of attitude and mantra. Is that fair, Bruce? Do you agree? Yeah. Yeah, and even like B size is an example of like there's a whole movement around that, which is great. But again, that's again. I mean, that's its own thing, and they sought to do that, and it was with purpose. That's not something that we ever sought to do. There's no like Shmoocon forums, or there's no official. Well, if there are, we don't know about them. Yeah, so, right. so <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, I mean, that's true, and, and Bruce and I, we work really hard to um, preserve our family culture, too. So even, like, throughout this chaos of the November and December months, like, we make a very concerted effort to, like, reserve one weekend day the whole month of December to do something with our kids, to put down the work. We went to New York City. We um, went to a chocolate festival. We went to a um, video game concert. And well, of course, we went to a chocolate festival. Hello! <laughs> <laughs> that was mommy's choice. Um, you know, the kids are like, fine. Um, but I mean, so that's who we are in general. And I think we just. Sorry. I thought that was like I'm saying one minute. Yeah, no. <laughs> you know? I that was like so I've six minutes ago. I've been clear all day, so there you go. Like that's fucking brilliant. Like that's. Anyway, so I, does that? I I don't know if that helps, but oh my god, yes, sir. Oh goodness, how do I determine which speakers speak at which time? So, um, that's fun. Um, nobody wants that Sunday morning spot, and I'm sorry it exists, somebody's gotta fill it. I, I look at, when I, when I set the schedule, I really look at um, the topics of the talks, and sometimes there's a clear, like, if someone wants to attend this talk, they're gonna want to probably also attend this subject, you know, line, and I won't put those talks against each other so that you know, there's kind of a track there that follows in subjects. I can't even think of an example, but y'all know what I mean, right? Um, and yeah, occasionally we get heavy hitters, like people who are going to attract a crowd, and I will always put those people up against each other because that's just the fairest thing to do. You, we had a lineup like that, you know, earlier today, I'm sure. Um, but the thing is, we tape all our talks, so you're never missing anything. You can watch it later, barring a taping catastrophe. I know we had streaming issues this morning, but the content was all captured, so you will see it later. Um, yeah. It's just, it's just, a, it's a game. I mean, it really is. And I'll do the schedule, and then I'll punt it to Bruce, and I'll be like, okay, did I mess up? You know, do I need to move anything? And sometimes he's like, no, it's great. Sometimes he's, uh, oh, he'll be like, no, I think this might be a little better. I also have to take into consideration if any of my speakers are like, look, I'm going to be there, but I can't be there until after, you know, my, I don't know. My, well, my plan. Usually, it's something like they're local and. 
my daughter has a birthday that day, but I'm going to come speak at your con, and my wife's going to kill me, but I at least have to be at the pinata or something like that, you know, um, which hasn't quite happened like that, but it's been close. Um, so there's a little concerns like that. Um, I mean, I, certainly from a, uh, looking at it through the optics of the speaker, you have to be fair to make sure that, um, I mean, I've given talks where I have been the big draw, and I know this room next to me had like five people in it, and then I've been in talks where it's the other way around, where I have five people in the room, and there's literally standing room only next door, and it doesn't feel good to be on either side of that, right? Like, you feel like shit, you know? I've, one place I almost took people on a field trip, I felt really bad. I was like, let's go next door and, and, and hang out. And, and, and so ahead. all I was gonna say is like, you, you, from, a, from a, an attendee perspective, they'll look at some of the times, be like, I wanna go to all three, well that's great. It's totally cool that you want to do that, but the right thing to do is have like those three talks that are all kind of similar and kind of draw similarly next to each other so that you have a balance. And that even from just a flow and fire marshal perspective and all kinds of other shit, like that's why you want to do that. Um, and, and I think it's, it's important to keep in mind like sometimes the speaker optics on that because the speakers are putting in their time, their energy and whatever, and they need to be able to have, um, you know, kind of a good experience as well. Okay. Um, I think we're about to get hooked. No, 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 they just, they, they need me in a minute. Um, I was going to say something else about that, oh, but I don't, I, don't, I don't remember. Well, I got distracted. Um, we're, we're totally over. Any other questions? I mean, did we answer your question, or at least sort of answer your question? Yes. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Oh, God, no. Oh. Not even close. All right, next question. No, Shmoo is not the mascot of ShmooCon. Um, the only reason we use the name Shmoo is because we were broke, broke, broke. We needed a do domain name, and um, he had had more money than us, at least for a hot minute, and he had purchased the domain name Shmoo.com. The guy whose nickname was Shmoo. Which we're not even going to go into that right yeah. now, but it's a, it's the, the guy story. whose nickname is Shmoo. There is, there is no ma it's It's a thing with the sunglasses. It's just it. It's a thing with sunglasses. We, we call it a seal. Um, but it's not that thing from that other thing where they sent us a letter and we won. Yeah, we had a, a, a C&D from Cap Enterprises, who yeah. owns the original Shmoo. Um, and they're pretty litigious. But we were able to show that Helps we, when you know like the premier um, yeah, we had some internet good, intellectual property Yeah, some good lawyer. IP lawyers. <laughs> yeah. And we were actually in front of their attempt to trademark it. The original Shmoo wasn't trademarked until after we had started doing this. And we were far enough in front of it that they couldn't claim trademark on it. Um, and to so go that, back, though, um, we had the domain sitting under my desk. It wasn't being used when we founded the Shmoo Group. We only called it the Shmoo Group because we all worked for technical support group TSG. So we had this domain, Shmoo, and we were like, well, we could call it TSG because we all work in TSG. That could be the Shmoo group, and that's it. No, nope, there's nothing glorious yeah. there. But we are definitely not associated with Cap Enterprises. Definitely not. Very, very clear. That is not, yeah. well, I don't even know what that is. All right. Andy Cap. The quantity of botting that we get, it's pretty low, honestly. Uh, we see very, very few. There's in measured in units. I mean, it um, does, it happens so fast. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, did you see me? Did you? That's what I really want to know. Like, I think that was actually his question. Uh, um, we, we, we haven't got, we haven't got to the point where we've named the bots yet, like APT6 and APT7 or anything like that, but we could tell like who's who. Um, in each round and, and basically what they're trying to do. Uh, but it is literally measured in units and the tickets that they get are, are nominal. I mean, it's very I mean, I mean, it, it's a lot, but it's not as much as you guys think there is, I guess. Yeah, I mean, there's a, like you see like posts online, there's a perception of like, it all goes to bots. No, 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 the vast, vast, vast Again, majority goes to bots. Again, on an airplane. Period. Hello, that's brilliant, I made my day. And every once in a while, like we put in something that I, best we can tell stopped all the bots in their place for a round, which is great. And then all live humans got it. Like it's it's really it's live humans who get tickets. There's just a lot of people, right? It turns out there's a lot of people who want to come here, and they all show up at noon on the same day and hit refresh, and like some of them get tickets. It's a it's, party. There's no conspiracy. That's just the way it is. All right, I gotta go deal with um, a thing. So yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, any last questions? Are we done? All right. All right, thank you everybody.